this is, uh, I'm Kelton Dowie, I'm a graduate architect, I only started at Jazzmax four weeks ago, I, it was a project I completed for my final year at architecture school last year, and it all began on Raoul Island, which is the northernmost territory of New Zealand, halfway between Auckland and Tonga, so a thousand kilometres north from here. I was up there with the Department of Conservation drawing up the buildings, as architects tend to do, and part of, well, some of the buildings I was drawing were huts, tramping huts, what we would think of. Uh, they were placed up there as animal control uh, for the hunters, basically. The, the island was infested with goats and rats and cats and all kinds of horrible stuff, all of which have been eliminated now. I came back to New Zealand and started my final year at architecture school and researched such buildings, huts being, you know, quite a neat thing for boys to be into. And there's lots of examples in the 60s and 70s. There were hundreds, literally uh, eight or 900 of them built throughout New Zealand, and they're owned by the Department of Conservation today. They still use huts to control animals. This one's being flown into uh, Resolution Island and Fiordland National Park. Getting the things there is the big challenge. Um, flying them by helicopter is pretty good, but it's a remote location. You can't just pop down to placemakers and get some more timber or nails or screws. So that got me thinking. I mean, how did they do it in the past? And this is the, the Levin Waiopihu Tramping Club carrying in their yeah. hut in uh, 1927. <laughs> And they literally rolled up the corrugated iron, put it on their back, and walked in to where they wanted a hut. So I was thinking, well, how can I design, as you know, an architect, aspiring architect anyway, a hut? So I was exposed or introduced to a, a traditional Māori way of, of construction, which had been uncovered in the Bay of Plenty, uh, an archaeological dig at a place called Kohika. They bound their buildings together. They lashed them and tied them. Interestingly, they found it around the outside of the members, so from the interior, which is the top shot in the last slide, you weren't able to see how it was held together. My tutors had had a go at making one of these buildings. No, the, the knowledge had, had uh, slipped from, from us as to how these things are made, because they couldn't see where the bindings were. They were covered in thatch on the outside, obviously. So they had a go at building one of these things, and I was like, oh, that's pretty neat. I'll have a go at that. I'll make some bits like that. So I did. So I found some bits of plywood and things together with the twine, which was pretty good, and I hadn't paid close attention to the photographs previously, and I admitted that there's a ridge pole that should be in there, which was unfortunate, but I managed to make a structure that actually held up pretty good. And with a bit of extra tension, which is what the cable, uh, the ratchet tie-downs do, I was able to make a structure that worked. Structure being pretty key, this is a uh, Farikai, it was a photo taken, I think, 1899 or so, Having worked out a structural system, let's just repeat it until we've got a big enough building for all the farm out. And uh, that's a pretty neat idea. Let's let's work out a, a portal frame that we can repeat to house as many people as need be. So I used my same ratchet tie downs and made some more structures. The obvious deficiency in this technique was that the water would get in up there, uh, weather tightness being fairly uh, hot topic in architecture circles. I was like, I better come up with a better a better solution. <laughs> than just overlapping a couple of bits of plywood. So I uh, thought I'd communicate what the complete building might look like. It's a, it's a hut. It's got the porch on the front, like a, like a typical pare, uh, which is a, a great space. And there's not many tramping huts in my extensive research that, that have such a porch, a place to, to put belongings that maybe don't need to be inside. And so that was a, a version of it. Around this time, someone pointed out that a folding up building is all about parts that come together, so fold together. The tsunami occurred in Samoa, and someone had pointed out to me a week or so bef before that that there was a lot of potential for a building that packed flat and could be transported quickly and easily and was lightweight in, in the Pacific. And I really love the idea that this binding, and, and which comes from canoe building technology, could be sent back as a way of putting buildings together. So I, I drew something up. This version used a, uh, a tarpaulin or a, an old uh, uh, billboard skin as the, the roof. And someone pointed out that the tough one is far too useful if you've just had a disaster. You'll sling that up between some trees and live under it. So I had to come up with a, a solution that where all the parts were integral. And this is a, a detail. It's perhaps the least interesting slide, but to me it's pretty neat. <laughs> it uses a cable basically around the roof and the wall, which makes the roof and wall integral. They become a single unit. And the two roof and wall units lean on each other, making a, a three-pin arch. Um, I'd made lots of models not just the few images you've seen, and managed to convince Unitech to, to kindly give me some funding to build one of these things at full size. So I was fairly busy making all these parts. 
Um, they're a sandwich construction, the skin of plywood on each side on polystyrene, so the insulation's integral and the, uh, the, the, the structure. So we assembled this thing and it takes two, two and a bit hours, four guys, and basically the, the wall unit, wall and roof units come joined together with a hinge. They're connected along the floor line there with just the pins going like a normal door hinge. And then we prop it into position and I run around tightening up typical fence strainers. There's a, a cable that runs from the ridge around the outside, making that wall roof junction permanent, solid at least. And so I built a complete building. It's just somewhat unheard of at architecture school. Most people build tiny little models and do lovely drawings. This is some of the details. The ridge line allows, which is the, the bottom image here, uh, looking straight up at the ridge, they're gate hinges, common. Uh, it's pulled apart to allow light to enter the building and also there's a, a clear ridge flashing that goes over the top where air, hot air can rise out of the top and be uh, dissipated. The idea being that we create a slightly better style of uh, shelter for people who've been affected by disaster. You remember in the, in the slide with the, the man standing on the beach and the, the sort of debris, the lower photo, which looks somewhat like the, uh, the emblem for this evening, is actually a, a style of disaster relief shelter which folds up, but the quality of existence you'd have if you lived in a building like that wouldn't be nearly as good as these people. <laughs> this shot is just because architecture students always put sexy Scandinavians in there. They photoshopped <laughs> them into the building. Two of my classmates were from Norway, and so I asked them to <laughs> have a coffee and sit on the front porch of this while I took a photograph. But this is my completed hut. Um, if you've got any ideas, thank you.